Kerry, we uh, in other jurisdictions like the United States and other provinces even, we hear a lot about demand side management in the electricity system. Uh, maybe you could de uh, define for us, what does DSM mean? Yeah, so uh, DSM is really three things. Um, energy efficiency, which basically means reducing the amount of energy we use um, and, and getting the same amount of work done. So you can think of things like LED light bulbs, um, more efficient furnaces, things like that. Uh, demand response is really shifting or shaving when we use energy to avoid peak demand. Um, and that's important because it helps us reduce uh, capacity need on the system. And then finally, uh, the third piece, which is more recent uh, because it hasn't been it hasn't been around as long as DER management, which is behind the meter energy resources. So you can think about if you have your own home and you have solar panels on it and you throw a battery as backup, uh, those sorts of resources can be aggregated and used on the grid as grid grid resources. That's DSM in a nutshell. It's really energy resources. Let's go through each one of those. Um, energy efficiency is interesting because, you know, LED lighting, I remember when it came in, oh, I can't even remember how long ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And uh, I don't think anybody had an, any idea how big an impact it would have on how we use electricity. Uh, now LEDs, uh, LED lights are the standard. They're so much better, so much controllable, use so much le less electricity. And it seems like this is the direction that electric uh, technologies are going, uh, isn't it? Yeah, so LED light bulbs are what we call a transformation, a market transformation technology. So when they came in, there was incandescent, there was something new called CFL before LED actually made it out. Um, and those those were always kind of the standard. We used incandescent light bulbs and, and that was the norm. Um, once we realized that there was this transformation that was occurring. So utilities helped invest in bringing LED lights to people and, and customers across the system. The, a market transformation occurred, which means the uptake became so big, we didn't have to incentivize for their use anymore. That is what demand side management programs do. They provide rebates and incentives to customers to reduce the amount of energy that they use in order to um, ensure that the grid remains reliable and has optimized energy usage. And that's a really good example is LED light bulbs. Yeah, we're seeing that with other technologies. Uh, for instance, I was uh, interviewing some, uh, an American entrepreneur and they were uh, installing systems now, HVAC uh, systems in commercial buildings that used artificial intelligence to uh, monitor. There would be sensors in all of the different rooms, the different parts of the building. And then the, uh, the AI would tell the system uh, heat this room, cool that room, turn off it all, turn it all off in that room. And, and not, it just made the whole system that much more efficient and use less le electricity. We're seeing that all over the place, aren't we? Yeah. And energy management systems are really, really critical, um, especially for large commercial and, uh, and those sorts of things, but they can be used uh, this, similarly in, in residential homes. You see smart thermostats, smart window coverings, things like that that can be controlled by an app or your little uh, Alexa in the corner. Um, so absolutely, those sorts of things can help reduce the amount of energy we use at any given time. And let's talk about demand response, because what that means is basically shifting the load. And it used to be that we designed these, you know, thermal, uh, our, our, we had these centralized power grids with thermal plants like coal and, and gas, and we would always plan for peak demand. But now we're being able to shift demand to different parts of the, and kind of smooth it out, put less stress on the, on the grid. How important is that? And how do we do it? Yeah, so demand response programs are, uh, they can be passive demand response programs in which uh, we ask customers to reduce energy usage during, say, a time where we might be seeing brownouts. The ISO did this last January uh, here in Alberta, basically said, like, we're, we're, we're at failure point here. If somebody doesn't do something, we're going to have trouble. Um, and, and Albertans just did that. They just reduced the amount of energy they used, and we avoided a really serious brownout blackout issue. Uh, but when they're controlled by the utility, for instance, if you look at EV managed charging programs, where the um, electricity, the sorry, the utility works with the third party and says, okay, if you've decided to be part of this program, we'll reimburse you uh, to be part of this program. 
and the third party comes in and actually controls when they charge their EV. Obviously, there are opt-in and opt-out privileges enabled. Nobody wants somebody to control their EV at all times if they have to go somewhere. But what that does is staggers when EVs charge. So you don't end up with like all EVs charging at 10 o'clock at night to avoid the peak. That just creates another shadow peak. So it really does keep that consistent, um, what we would call a flat line of energy usage. And Alberta is kind of unique in the sense that uh, 75 or 80 percent of its electricity demand comes from industry, industry and big commercial and, and so on, and only maybe 20, 25 percent from residential. Does that focus or the predominance of industry on the grid uh, allow for more uh, more opportunities to practice demand response? So my understanding is it's about 65 to 70 percent industrial load. Um, which is still huge. Uh, that's 30 to 35 percent then is left uh, to the remaining customers on the grid. They already have opportunities to do this. That's already enabled through things like ancillary services on the ISO side, on the on the transmission side. They're already, if they wish to, can supply extra energy back to the grid when they want to. They get paid to curtail and come off if it's required and they can do so. Uh, they sign up for those ancillary services programs, but there is nothing on the distribution side that enables the same thing. And the way I look at the system, um, even though in Alberta we tend to try to keep the system separate, we have generation, we have transmission, we have distribution, we have retailers and, and customers, all these systems are still integrated. So if you're putting extra generation and infrastructure onto the larger bulk side, it does impact those costs flow through to all rate pay payers at the end. Um, so if you use something like demand side management with smaller commercial buildings, industrials, residential customers that aren't necessarily T connected, you can still see those same downstream impacts on the infrastructure costs. Yeah, that's a really important part of this. I mean, the grid is growing uh, generation. We need two or three times as much electricity by 2050. And rather than do it the way we have done, which is just build, build, build more infrastructure and power generation, th this allows us to do things smarter, which is leads me into questions about distributed energy resources. I'm really seeing this explode down in the U.S. and in the global, in the global South because uh, given their creaky old grid down in parts of the U.S., uh, people are worried that you know their house or their built their business is going to is going to be the you know going to be a brownout blackout and and they're, it's going to cost them a lot of money so they're putting in solar batteries and digital controls as and Alberta started along that path the last year or two and and for industry you know because it wanted industry to self generate and take strain off the grid. And then it seemed to kind of back off on that. Uh, have I got that right? Um, I'm not not sure. Like, I think if you look at the data centers that, that are coming in, the ASO is looking at procuring, I, I can't remember, um, I think it's about 1.2 gigawatts by 2028, but there's 16 gigawatts of requested power. Um, and they're basically saying, we're going to position you um, more appropriately in the system. You'll have first come, first serve if you supply your own generation. But that doesn't change the fact that we still need to provide backup supply uh, to those operations. So they're still grid connected. So that infrastructure is still there. And again, without any other way to manage that amount of supply on the system, without being able to use um, demand side resources, such as distributed energy resources and things like that to help flatten peaks and to, and to optimize those grid assets, you're just gonna have to build. Um, DSM is the only tool that can be easily deployed across Alberta um, with very limited um, ramp up time because energy efficiency programs have run ev everywhere before AMI metering was like, even a thing. Um, so we know that they work and we know they increase reliability and we know they reduce strain. What... Um... I mean, we're seeing this all all over the place uh, across uh, North America, and it is. I mean, as you say, this is not new, and we've got lots of experience. Why is it so? Has it been so slow to catch on in Alberta? Um, that goes back to some policy changes and um, policy issues that occurred back in about 2010. I would suggest 
Um, ACO did have a few energy efficiency programs back then, and they applied in their rate application for some, some more, some upgrades to some of their energy efficiency programs. And unfortunately, back then, the AUC ruled that um, demand side management or energy efficiency was not in the purview of a distribution utility. It was not part of their role. Their role was to build poles and wires and connect people to the system. Um, that has changed. That, that thought conversation has shifted. And in 2023, there were three out of the four, I think, distribution utilities who applied for some form of demand side management programs. And outside of an EV managed charging pilot that was approved uh, for Fortis, Alberta, all the others were denied. Uh, the AUC did say then, though, that they didn't, they could see that demand side management would be uh, useful uh, to distribution utilities in that those programs tend to help rate pairs with costs on the system. Um, the problem is they have never been given a policy to actually go ahead and enable this. So there is no mandate for distribution utilities to do this. They are not assured of cost recovery to do it. And so instead, what they do is continue to do what they've always done, which is build. Uh, let's wrap up the interview uh, this way, uh, Kerry. Um, your report uh, notes that for every dollar invested in demand side management, it returns up to $4 in system savings, whether maybe that's avoided uh, construction like new equipment, whatever it might be. Uh, boy, I, I most businesses that I know, if they got a 400% return on their capital invested, they would be pretty happy to do it. So really, it's about the economics of this, isn't it? It is. This is not, demand side management is a resource, like any resource, including supply side generation. So you can look at it the same way you would look at a gas generator or a wind generator. Demand side management is a resource. The difference is it saves megawatts. So you build less. Um, if we start thinking of it that way, instead of a conservation mechanism, which it is not, it is a grid resource, um, we start to realize that it is, pro it is absolutely the cheapest, most cost-effective resource we can use, and we should be considering it as the first front line before we build, before we do anything else. Carrie, thank you very much for this. Thank you.